So I got a question for you. Did humans witness the Ice Age floods? Is that a crazy question? Like the Pacific Northwest, Missoula floods, you've heard of those, Native Americans. I think it's a reasonable question. And here's why I don't think it's a dumb question. Did humans witness at least some of the last Ice Age floods? We have some new dates for the Ice Age floods, and I want to share some of those dates with you tonight. We also have some new dates from archaeological sites around the Pacific Northwest. And those dates are starting to overlap. The archaeological sites that are old and the Ice Age flood dates that are young. Now i got to be careful. I'm not saying we have direct evidence yet of Native Americans dealing with the Ice Age floods and whatever dealing with, I don't know what that means, watching or, 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 or you know, I mean, God forbid, uh, it coming down a coulee. I mean, you can fill in the blanks, and we have no evidence of that directly. But as we continue to get new and more and more dates, and we continue to have more archaeological finds, uh, I think it's just a matter of time before we have that direct evidence. So we're in the ballpark with humans and at least the youngest of the Ice Age floods. But this is not an archaeological talk. I don't know anything about archaeology. I've got a few slides to show you of some famous digs in Washington towards the end of tonight. But I am a geology person, and I do know about the Ice Age floods, and I would like to spend tonight talking about dates of the Ice Age flood. The title is Dating the Ice Age Floods. And this lecture was inspired by two relatively new scientific papers that came out just in the last three years. One, by a guy who's been working on floods geology for 50 years. His name is Richard Waite. 50 years. Been thinking about it for five decades. And he's still doing important work. So his paper is based on things called slack water sediments, and we'll talk about that, and some dates coming from slack water sediments. The other paper is from a gal right out of college, just finished her PhD, and she's using a brand new technique. She's using a brand new technique, using flood erratics, boulders that were deposited by the Ice Age floods. And the good news is, Andrea's paper, Andrea Balbus is her name, Andrea's paper and Richard's paper essentially agree. Even though we have two very different workers from different generations using different techniques, and yet a basic Ice Age flood story has emerged with some dates. And so before we're done with the chalkboard, before we go to the visuals, I want to share some of that basic chronology, very basic, and there's room for improvement, but we've got some uh, dates to put together. Okay, now, the Ice Age floods, if you're a rookie here, we're talking about water from Montana cruising across Washington and going all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. And many of those floods, not just happening once. It's almost impossible to believe. But there is no debate in science about whether these floods happened or not. All you got to do is go out and see these places. I challenge you to go up right up the middle of a coulee floor and look at the size of that canyon, and there's no river in the canyon, by the way, and actually realize that that thing formed quickly by Ice Age floods. Or go to Dry Falls, you've heard of that. Go to the top of Dry Falls and see these enormous potholes that are 50 feet deep that are drilled directly into the bench, the bedrock of that material. The water did that. Or if that doesn't turn you on, you can go to places where there's rocks, boulders, that are stacked 600 feet high, and the landform is 10 miles long. That's East Wenatchee, a gigantic flood bar. There's no other way to explain that except to have Ice Age floods come down to Columbia. So in science, there is no debate that these floods happened. But this business about dating floods, getting a date, getting a specific date for some of these floods, that's a tougher sell. And we're in progress. We're in the progress. We're, we're, in, we're kind of developing these dates as we go. And I want to mainly show you how we come up with these dates, these numbers for some of these Ice Age floods. The main theme I want to uh, is expand on here tonight is we need to go where the floodwaters were quiet. If we want, how do you date a flood? I mean, it's a bunch of water that went across this map thousands of years ago. How are you supposed to figure out when that happened? The water's gone. 
The answer is if you can go to the quiet water, and I'll show you spots and we'll look at the evidence, there's things in that quiet water that we can deposit. I'll expand on that. So we're not going to the sexy places tonight. We're not going to dry, dry falls and these other huge coolies where the water is loud and it's, it's tearing up the ground. And that's the stuff that draws all of us to this Ice Age flood story, but we're not going there. That's too energetic for us tonight. We want to look for deposits, the deposits of the Ice Age floods. So we can't even answer basic questions like, how many floods were there? Was there two, were there two floods, five floods, 40 floods, 89 floods, 100 floods? Folks of you that know it and have done a lot of reading about these floods recognize those numbers. Those numbers are all over the place. Where do those numbers come from? Can't we decide? And the floods, when did they happen? Did they happen 15,000 years ago or between 18,000? You get it. There's all these numbers out there. Where do the numbers come from and where are we going? with eventually trying to be very specific about these flood events. So we're going to quiet water tonight. Don't mean to disappoint you. We're not going to the loud, angry water. We're going to the quiet water. So with that said, let's go ahead and use this map of the Pacific Northwest and talk about where this quiet water is, where we're going to earn our money tonight. So the first place, obviously, is a beautiful Ice Age lake. It's called Glacial Lake Missoula, and it's the source of many, probably not all, but many of the Ice Age floods of the Pacific Northwest. Why is Glacial Lake Missoula there? Well, this lobe of the ice sheet, called the Purcell Trench Lobe, the Purcell Lobe, we'll just put a P there. The reason Glacial Lake Missoula is there is because the Purcell Lobe is blocking the meltwater and not letting it leave Montana. So we have an ice dam, a constriction. This is the ice sheet coming across the border from Canada. And this Purcell lobe is creating this lake, Glacial Lake Missoula. More quiet water. There's another one of these lakes. GLC, Glacial Lake Columbia. It also exists because we have one of these lobes of ice. In this case, it's called the Okanagan Lobe in north central Washington. So Okanagan Lobe, think of it as a barrier, a roadblock, and not allowing this water to go anywhere. Same with the Purcell Lobe. Got it? Think of those two lakes like bathtubs. And we're going to fill the bathtub with water because there's nowhere for that water to go. And there's a plug in the drain of the bathtub. There's no way for the water to drain out of the lake, both for Glacial Lake Missoula and Glacial Lake Columbia. We're finally going to have a flood if we break through the Purcell ice lobe, we bust up the ice dam and we have that water surge. And in the case of Glacial Lake Missoula, oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes, the water of Glacial Lake Missoula would spill into this next bathtub and overfill the bathtub called Glacial Lake Columbia, and then that water is going to cruise over eastern Washington. Those are the Ice Age floods. This is the water that's eventually going to get to the Pacific Ocean, okay? There's a third lake that's often overlooked, and it's big for us tonight. It's down here in southern Washington. I'll shape it like this, and I'll put LL. This is Lake Lewis, Tri-Cities, Yakima, other places, Walla Walla, Lewiston, Idaho, Lake Lewis. So this lake is different for a couple of reasons. First of all, we're not calling it Glacial Lake Lewis because it's not ponded water from going up against an ice sheet. In other words, the dam is not the ice sheet. We're too far south. The dam for Lake Lewis is a ridge called the Horse Heaven Hills. They're still there. And there's a gap in the Horse Heaven Hills called Wallula Gap. So instead of a bathtub with a cork or a plug in the drain, the, the trick for understanding Lake Lewis is it's a bathtub with an open drain. We're never going to plug Wallula Gap. There's nothing to plug it. So Lake Lewis is different than these guys because Lake Lewis is only going to be there for a few days. We're going to have a flood. We're going to get water leaving these lakes. We're going to have a very temporary Lake Lewis. Just for a few days because of an open drain, the water is threading through Wallula Gap, and that water is coming down the Columbia River over Portland and going to the Pacific Ocean. 
I'll show you the evidence for why we know that Lake Lewis is short-lived compared to these other lakes, which are long-lived. Okay, even the beginners to this story, at least now, have been introduced to the basic ideas of these floods. And again, I'm not doing any circling here because I want to keep this nice and open. And I'm never going to circle some of these things because it's an open question. But I do have some specifics for you, and I'm excited to get to that soon enough. The Ice Age, by the way, is really the last 2.6 million years of time. We're still in the Ice Age. We still have ice on the planet. And uh, um, so we really have a full 2.6 million years to work with if we really want to talk about potential for when these Ice Age floods happened. Our story, however, that I'm sharing tonight is going to be confined to the last 20,000 years. Um, more coming on that as well. So these are the two pieces of field evidence that I want to share with you tonight, and both of them need some explanation. What the hell's this? I think I know what those are, you say. Those are boulders out in the desert, but how are you going to use those to figure out where an Ice Age flood happened? Okay, let's get, uh, the energy is outstanding in the room. We've got, you know, you can hear a pin drop. We've got 300 people in the room, and uh, you're well behaved. Damn it, you're just well behaved. I appreciate that energy. So let's start with slackwater sediments. Let's go to Lake Lewis and try to understand what a slackwater sediment is. All right, so let's make a sunny day. And let's have the land down here. And here's the top of Lake Lewis. Okay, we had a bunch of water, hundreds of feet of water sitting. And why is the water there? We had a flood. We had water from Glacial Lake Missoula, breached the ice dam, dump into Glacial Lake Columbia, most times. That water spills south, and then we get this third lake. Why? Because we've got this narrow slot, this Wallula Gap, and all that water can't get through that gap at once. So the water has to wait its turn, and the water is backing up behind Horse Heaven Hills and Wallula Gap. That's the one with the open drain, and it just lasts for a few days. Even though there's just a few days, there's a concept that we need to explain slack water sediments. Ready? Here we go. When this water first shows up to form Lake Lewis, it's chocolate milk. It's brown water. That's a key point. Why is it brown? Well, the floods left Montana. They're cruising over eastern Washington, and they're picking up soil. They're picking up a lot of, they're picking up some rocks, too, and some other things. But they're mostly picking up soil, silt, the consistency of kitchen flour. And when the water is moving quickly, 60 miles an hour, let's say, that, that silt, that soil, is held in suspension. And even when the, the water first stops, it's still chocolate milk because this stuff is all floating. We can make some silt for you if you like. I'm here on Mint. I'm a public servant. Okay? Now, it's chocolate milk. But as Lake Lewis water sits there, Hour after hour after hour, what's going to change? I think the color of the chocolate milk is going to change. What's going to happen? Our silt is going to start dropping, isn't it? We're going to have gravity pull that silt down. And over the course of, I don't know, take your pick, a day, two days, three days, five days, uh, nobody really knows. But the point is that with each passing day, that water of Lake Lewis is going to get more and more clear because the sediment is going to drop out. And what we're left with, I'll do it like this, is a deposit. We have taken that soil upstream, picked it up, moved it by the flood water, and now it's in Lake Lewis and it's being redeposited. That's what a slack water sediment layer is. I'll do just slack, okay? A slack water sediment layer. So even if we finally then drain the water away, and where's it going? It's going through Wallula Gap, it's coming down the Columbia River Gorge and out to sea. Even though the water's now gone, we're left with a layer of sediment. Okay. But what are we supposed to do with that? How are we supposed to get a date from that? Just a bunch of silt, a bunch of kitchen flour. Okay, well, I'll put that on hold for a second. Um, we're going to go to a place near Walla Walla, Washington. It's called Burlingame Ravine. It's a famous place. 
And there are 40, I don't have time to draw them all, there are 40 of these slack water sediment layers, one on top of another. I'll show you video clips and photos from this place in just a bit. Uh, I'm not much of an artist, but I did mean to show that the layers of slack water sediment at Burlingame Ravine near Walla Walla are the thickest at the bottom, and they get thinner and thinner as you go up. And we're going to see that with many of these deposits across the northwest. By the way, we're going here next, and we're going there next, and there's going to be slack water sediments in those lakes as well, with the same finding upward pattern. Okay, so we've got 40 slack water sediment layers. And I just explained that that's one flood event, at least I intended to explain that. So if we have 40 slack water sediments at Walla Walla, I guess we had 40 floods. That's where that number comes from. So this, why are we overthinking this? That's, that's it, that must be the answer. There were 40 floods. Well, there's other places that have more than 40. There's other places that have less than 40. And the real trouble is we can't find specific dates from the stack. In other words, we don't have a method yet to actually get an age for each of these slack water sediment layers. It's just a bunch of kitchen flour. But in the case of Burlingame Ravine, we're lucky. If you count down 11 slack water sediment layers from the top at Burlingame Ravine, I know this isn't 11, but I'm going to put it in. Between the 11th and the 12th one down, there's a fine layer of volcanic ash that was deposited after one slack water sediment, after one flood, but before the next flood. Well, that's awfully helpful because as a geologist, we can go and sample that ash and send it to a laboratory and they can give us some chemistry, uh, isotopic signature, a finger, chemical fingerprint of that ash and tell us which volcano erupted. And more importantly, we can figure out when that eruption happened so that we can know where we are in the story. Well, at Burlingame Ravine, near Walla Walla, the 11th layer down, that is Mount St. Helens Ash. But not from 1980. <laughs> I don't remember 11 floods since 1980, do you? Instead, this is the Mount St. Helens S Tephra, geologists have Rome, uh, big letters for each of these things. And the date for the St. Helens ash is 16,300 years ago. 16,300 years ago. So there we go. We've got a date. Now, what does the date mean? Well, we know we have some Ice Age flooding 11 times after 16,300 years ago and 28 times before. And that's all we can say. We only have one time marker in the stack of 40. You starting to get the picture? That's, that was done in the 1970s by Richard Wade. Um, there's other places that I'll take you that are similar to this. Zilla, Granger, uh, the White Bluffs, uh, Lewiston, Idaho. I'll show you visually all those places that are related to Lake Lewis, but let's leave, leave that lake and go up to Glacial Lake Columbia. Uh, to save time, I did Glacial Lake Columbia before you showed up. And so just for a moment here, I'm going to put this black chalkboard in front of us. Uh, sorry. So now we're leaving Lake Lewis and we're going up to Glacial Lake Columbia. This is the one that was dammed by the Okanagan Mo. This is basically upriver from Grand Coulee Dam, where the Spokane River Valley and the Columbia River Valley come together. And this is a famous place. Again, I say famous. Famous among you know, a few geologists who you know, make pilgrimages to these places on occasion. So um, this is work done in the sand poil arm of Lake Roosevelt uh, by a guy named Brian Atwater. And that's a recognizable name to many of you. That's the guy that, after he did this work in the early 1980s, started working on the ghost forest and the whole mega quake thing on the coast. So he has done important work in more than one discipline. Uh, so here we are up in the bottom of Glacial Lake Columbia. And not only has Brian Atwater been working here, but in the last 10 years, Michelle Hansen from Canada, I think Saskatchewan, has done some work in these same Glacial Lake Columbia sediments. 
What have they found? They found 89 of these things. 89 slack water sediments instead of the 40 we had down by Walla Walla. Again, the layers are getting a little bit thinner as we go up. So human nature says, well, I guess we've got you know our 40 down in Walla Walla. There must be 40 of these 89. But we need proof. We need dates. We need to be able to correlate. And there are no ashes at all. Our friend, the Mount St. Helens, said S ash is gone. It's not there. I shouldn't say gone. It probably never fell that far north in Washington. So do we have any dates? We do. Atwater, in the early 1980s, pulled a twig or a stick out of one of the slack water sediment layers. And Michelle Hansen, a few years ago, found some plant detritus. I guess that means little fragments of leaves or something. I'm not quite sure. But the point is, they both have organic carbon with it. So we can do some radiocarbon dating from the stick and from the plant fragments. And the date that Atwater got from this stick, I don't know how many layers up I should know, I'm sorry, uh, 14,490 years, radiocarbon years. Now let's pause and realize that there's a difference between radiocarbon years and calendar years. That adds to the confusion when you're reading books or articles or seeing a program on TV about the Ice Age flood. When you hear these dates, your first thought should be, are they radiocarbon years or calendar years? Because they're different. Yeah. And I don't have time to talk about why they're different and, and the, the, the carbon cycle, et cetera, things like that, and atmospheric carbon. But I do want to say that there's a simple way to convert these dates from radiocarbon to calendar years. So in yellow, Brian's twig is 17,700 calendar years. And we have calendar years here from our volcanic ash. Michelle, her plant detritus, uh, carbon 14 dates, 13,400. We recalibrate those carbon dates, those radiocarbon years, to calendar years, and we're at 16,000. So we've got two things here now. We've got Glacial Lake Columbia. We've got Lake Lewis. We've got three precious dates out of all those slack water sediment layers. Again, that's where these dates are coming from. There's a brand new technique, OSL dating. OSL stands for Optically Stimulated Luminescence. If I had to read it, I must not know that much about it, and that's true. But the hope is that OSL dating can give us a date for each layer. It's a surface exposure dating method that I don't really want to talk about because I don't know much about it. There are OSL dates now, but they're not very reliable. That's the general consensus. It's tough to put a lot of worth in some of these OSL dates. So for now, uh, I'm not going to uh, dive into the OSL dates. But we just got those three dates. Let me pick up the pace and do one more thing. We've got to go to Glacial Lake Columbia. I shouldn't erase that date, 16,300. So quickly, let's go to Glacial Lake Missoula. So now we've crossed over into Montana. We're in the floor of that third lake, the source of many, but not all, of the Ice Age floods. What am I going to draw? You know what I'm going to draw. I'm going to draw the same pattern, fat slack water sediment layers getting thinner and thinner as we go up. And this section is famous, again, among geologists. It's right along I-90. You've passed it every time you drive on I-90 to Missoula. It's called Nine Mile. It's a nine-mile road, there's a nine-mile exit, and I, when I show you the photos, I'm sure you've noticed it, even if you didn't know what you were looking at. So these are the famous slack water sediments at the bottom of Glacial Lake Missoula. This is easy, because there's nothing to date. We have how many? We have 34 slack water sediments at Nine Mile. Michelle Hansen did this work as well in 2011. The only thing we can date is the very top of the exposure. I should use white because it's another volcanic ash layer. And you're like, oh, goody, we're, we're in luck. Mount St. Helens ash, our old friend, can really help us out. It's not. It's a different volcanic ash with a different age from a different volcano. This is Glacier Peak. 
an active volcano north of Stevens Pass. You maybe don't know it. It's not very visible from civilization, but it's a beautiful cone volcano just like the others. And the Glacier Peak Ash, which is also a very useful time marker for us, is 13,600. St. Helens Ash, 16,300. Glacier Peak Ash, 13,600. So what's my point? A couple points from the slack water sediments at these three locations. And again, I've got a lot of visuals to visit all these places. Here are the two main points. Dates that we do know of the Ice Age floods are primarily coming from these datable horizons within the slack water sediment stack. And secondly, we're having a hell of a time correlating these beds between location. Early on, 30, 40 years ago, it looked like, oh, these must be the same beds as these and must be looking the same as those guys over there. They all find upwards. Can't we just correlate everything and be good? But with these dates coming in, it's clear we can't correlate bed for bed. Okay, we're changing gears. Thank you for that energy. We're going to go to these flood erratics and talk very briefly about them because I think the visuals are going to work better than the chalkboard for this. Um, but I can help you out. So we're switching from Richard Waite and the stratigraphy, which we were just talking about, to Andrea Baldus, the gal right out of PhD school. <coughs> Very nice gal. We're going to have meet both of them uh, with short interview clips coming in a bit. And so Andrea didn't invent this technique, but she has uh, been using it. John Stone is another guy from the University of Washington who's been using this. And so in this picture, we're going to talk about a big old rock. And that rock was clearly moved tens of miles, maybe a hundred miles, maybe more than a hundred miles to get this location. The floods, the Ice Age floods, brought that boulder in. You might go, well, how's that even possible? That's a huge boulder. Bigger than, I don't know how big this guy is, but it's big. Well, quite often, these boulders were rafted in on blocks of ice. I'll explain with the visuals. But the point is, they were definitely brought in by the Ice Age floods. Okay. So Andrea and others, John Stone, say, I think I can figure out how long that rock has been sitting there. So as a geologist, what do you do? Do you just go and sample a piece of the rock and send it to a lab and get an age? That would be the age of the rock, right? That would be the age, let's say this is a granite, this is a white granite with a bunch of dark brown basalt lava rock, okay? And the closest to the white granite in bedrock form is 100 miles in length. So uh, if we just get an age from the granite, we've got an age for the frickin' granite, like the magmas beneath the volcano you know, 100 million years ago or whatever, it's not gonna help us. We want the age of what? We want the age of the flood. When did the water bring this thing in and drop it? The water's gone, but how many years has that rock been sitting here? All right, give me a chance now. We need sun again. And we need a lot of solar radiation or cosmic rays coming from the sun every minute of every hour of every day of every year of every century and we're going to have cosmic rays bombarding the surface of that boulder. So what Andrea and John Stone are doing is they're carefully looking for just the right boulder. It looks like the boulder's been moved by a bobcat or something, and you're not going to use it. You've got to find a boulder that has been sitting still, pristine, since the Ice Age. And that sounds like a stretch, but many of them have no signs of movement since the Ice Age. Okay, next step. We need a good-looking surface on that boulder, on that flood around. Can't have a bunch of lichen on it, can't have some other stuff getting in the way. So a nice, clean surface. Now, John or Andrea, Andrea for our purposes tonight, is going to sample just the upper portion of that boulder. And she's going to send that sample into the lab. And they're going to look for isotopes that are in that surface of that boulder. If I gotta go to the notes, I'm out of my element again. Oh, no pun intended. I am gonna talk about elements. God, I don't even mean that. That's so clever. Not really. That's a grown-up. 
So I'll make this quick. I don't want to get bogged down. But not only do we want to have the right boulder, we want to have some quartz minerals. We want to have the mineral quartz exposed on the surface of this boulder. This is surface exposure data, the process that I'm describing. If you want a more formal term, cosmogenic radionuclide data, cosmogenic radionuclide data. So uh, cut to the chase. As we expose the surface and those quartzes to solar radiation, to cosmic rays, we're slowly going to convert some oxygen-16 to a daughter isotope called beryllium-10. And the silica, sorry, this is SI, the silica that's in the quartz, quartz is silica and oxygen, that's it. The silica in the quartz is going to radioactively decay into some aluminum, aluminum-26. So in the lab, you're going to measure how much beryllium, how much aluminum, how much silicon, how much oxygen is in that quartz. And if we know the half-life for the decay of those two radioactive pairs, we can calculate the age. And you're like, okay, I think I got what you said, but I don't know if I believe it. I'll cut to the chase, the real chase. The dates that Andrea and John are getting and the dates that Richard is getting, I agree. So if one method was just absolute baloney, we wouldn't have any sort of general agreement. But we've got multiple erratics from multiple locations, multiple samples, multiple dates, and the locations of those dates work beautifully with field relations and other things that Richard and other field geologists put together. So the story that emerging is exciting based on these two main types of evidence, and it's these two uh, deposits that hold a lot of promise for the future. Before we quit with the chalkboard and just have a feast visually, I would like to quickly, I'm going to leave that map, I'm going to quickly draw a cartoon of the story that has now emerged, the chronology that involved places that you know and love, Grand Coulee, Dry Falls, Wenatchee, Moses Cooley, Quincy Basin. Can we say anything about when those floods happened? We can. I wouldn't waste your time with all this data if there wasn't a payoff. Here is the payoff. I don't know how it'll feel, but here's the payoff. So I'm going to draw a cartoon of a cartoon. How about that? This is really going nuts now. Crazy drawing. Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington. These are both the same place. So I'm doing it this way because... Oh, uh, shoot, hang on. I need some space to draw the story. So um, I want to do 18,000, 18, yes, 16,000, 14,000, 13,300. There's a lot that can be talked about with this emerging story. I'm choosing to do it this way. Four chapters to our story. It involves our two lobes, our Okanagan lobe and our Purcell lobe, and where the Ice Age floods are going to travel based on the position of those two lobes. Are you ready? Yes. All right. 18,000 years. Oh, you know what? I need one more thing. I got to put the Columbia River in here. So here's Wenatchee, Washington. Here's Chelan, Washington. Here's Spokane, Washington. The Spokane River's coming in. Okay. The story goes like this. Based on evidence. It's not a story without evidence. Based on the evidence we just talked about. And the dates from the erratics and the slack water sediments. The Purcell lobe was in place before the Okanagan lobe got in place. So 18,000 years ago, we have a Purcell lobe. Therefore, we have a glacial lake, Missoula. But we do not have an Okanagan lobe in Washington. So therefore, we don't have a glacial lake, Columbia. So do we have Ice Age floods 18,000 years ago? We do. Where did the water go? Because the Okanagan lobe is not in place, our floods of water from Montana 
are going to find their way to the Columbia River and follow the Columbia River all the way to the ocean. So to keep track of this, we have big floods, big floods, 18,000 years ago. And Wenatchee is wet. We have floods coming right over the city of Wenatchee. Okay? Wenatchee wet 18,000 years ago because the Okanagan Lobe is not in place yet. Erratics from Andrea, etc., backing this up. Next step. Now the Okanagan lobe is going to grow, and we're going to get both lobes just as I drew them over there. Okanagan lobe is now in place, and the Purcell lobe is in place. We are now roughly 16,000 years ago. So now we do the daisy chain thing I was talking about before. If we break through the ice dam uh, from Glacial Lake Missoula, that's going to dump into Glacial Lake Columbia. Glacial Lake Columbia, that water can't go anywhere. Why? Because the Okanagan Lobe is in place. So the daisy chain I'm talking about is um, drain the bathtub, overfill this bathtub, and now we've got Ice Age floods coming down the Cheney Palouse track, which is a straight shot from Spokane down to Tri-Cities, basically um, through eastern Washington. And we start having major floods coming down the Grand Coulee over Dry Falls. Why? The Okanagan Lobe is in the way. Wenatchee and Chelan are dry during this time. We can't get any Ice Age floods coming down this northwest route because the Okanagan is in place. We keep going. 14,000 years ago, the Purcell Lobe is gone. Glacial Lake Missoula is gone. We still have Glacial Lake Columbia, or 14,000 years ago, and we have one last major flood. Why? Because we finally have enough water in Glacial Lake Columbia to breach it. We're breaching the Okanagan Lobe for the first time. It was the Purcell Lobe that kept getting broken and rebuilt, broken and rebuilt, but we never did breach the Okanagan Lobe, according to these dates, until 14,000 years ago. And the last major flood in the Pacific Northwest is 14,000 years ago, where we have water coming down the Columbia. I'll show you the giant current ripples at West Bar that are the best evidence of this 14,000 year flood coming down the Columbia. There is a fourth, but it's almost like a little coda if you're a music fan, the little coda right at the end of our performance. It's a small flood. Weight puts the date at 13,300. By this time, we don't have the Okanagan anymore. We don't have the Purcell anymore. We don't have the lakes anymore. And we have one last flood, a small flood, coming down the Columbia. Unclear where the source is. Wade's got some ideas, but let's just leave it like that. i got to say two more things before we go with the chalkboard. If you're a Canadian geologist, you are convinced that not all the water is coming from Montana and that sometimes major floods are going to be coming directly across the border from underneath the Okanagan Lobe. And particularly, this plays a role with Moses Cooley, which I'm really not talking about here. The other thing I want to say briefly is that there is another flood we can put on this map. It's a flood that happened once, but it came from a lake in Utah called Lake Bonneville, I can do it over here, Lake Bonneville, which sat in much of western Utah where the Great Salt Lake is now. And 17,400 years ago, the Bonneville flood, one flood, totally different than our floods we were talking about tonight, is going to break over Red Rock Pass, the water's going to go over my in-law's house in Pocatello, Idaho, it's going to go down the Snake River, Twin Falls, Boise, of one major flood, the Bonneville flood, is going to come through Hell's Canyon, and it also is going to follow the Columbia River Gorge. It's worth mentioning the Bonneville flood because it's going to help us date some of our slack water sediments in the Lewiston, Idaho area. You're in Ellensburg, Washington at the Hell Home Center in the middle of the state. Wonderful. Yes, we had a bunch of ice. It covered much of Canada, crossed the border uh, back at this time. Channeled Scablands, yes. Ice Age floods, Glacial Lake Missoula, bursting through the Purcell Lobe, here's the Okanagan Lobe, 
Everything is on this map at full uh, position. Let's look quickly at the bedrock. The salt lava rock is the bedrock of eastern Washington, layer upon layer, 300 separate layers. These lavas were 15 million years old, long, long, long before the Ice Age. Were way older than the Ice Age by more than 15 by more than 14 million years. The lavas came out of deep cracks. The lavas flooded the surface, and eastern Washington would have looked like this at each of these cracks, these fissures. Beautiful floods of lava. This is Iceland today, but we need a much larger scale to imagine the flood basalts of eastern Washington. When you have one of these 300 layers being formed, you have very watery-like, that's important to us tonight, but it's lava, watery-like lava flooding the surface and crystallizing. So each time we have a flood, 15 million years ago, long before the Ice Age, we have a featureless plain like this. In places, that stack of lavas is more than two miles thick. In some places, it's more than three miles thick. And I'm spending time with this because this is the rock we're going to erode at places like Dry Falls, where the Ice Age floodwaters are angry, where they're loud. Now, one other thing to mention is that many places, those basalt lavas are no longer flat. They're warped into ridges, the ridges of central Washington, Manash, Tash, Antenna, etc. Those ridges were there during the Ice Age. So let me show you just a quick glimpse that water coming down the Grand Coulee, filling the Quincy Basin, but notice the water is being deflected by Saddle Mountains, Frenchman Hills, etc. So it's tough to put these things in perspective, but the floods are very recent, just a few thousand years ago compared to the lava rock and the ridges. Yes, there was ice, we got it. Yes, there was ice, we've got it. The ice sheet itself never got to I-90 in Washington, didn't even get to US-2, the old Sunset Highway, but almost. North of US-2, we have beautiful glacial deposits. Not floods now, just glacial deposits. Moraines helping us figure out where the ice used to be. And beautiful boulders like this. This is up by Chelan. Each of these is an erratic, but it's a glacial erratic dropped by the ice, not the floods quite yet. Andrea was up here doing the surface exposure dating on these guys, but just to get the position of the ice at a particular time. This is the most famous of the glacial erratics in Washington. It's called Jaeger Rock up on Mansfield Plateau. Beautiful. Now, the next concept is, if you're next to a huge ice sheet, you commonly have thick deposits of wind-blown silt called loess. This is a global pattern. Anytime you have a huge ice sheet, you have a bunch of wind-blown silt called loess. And in places in eastern Washington, it's up to 200 feet thick. If you go to Wash Tuckna on 26, and you stop illegally, and you look into the bank, <laughs> you can look carefully, and there are volcanic ash layers in the loess. And you might go, oh, well, maybe that's our Mount St. Helens from 16,300 years ago. Turns out this one is 1.1 million years old from a volcanic eruption in northern Washington called the Kulshan Caldera. So the Luss goes back all the way to the beginning of the Ice Age, two and a half million years. The Luss is an old, old story. And the Luss, of course, piles into these beautiful rolling hills that we know as we head over towards Pullman. Luss comprises, that wind-blown silt comprises everything there. And if we didn't have the ice sheet in Washington, we wouldn't have those Palouse Hills. Now, I've got a friend named Tom who lives in Spokane, and he likes to fly his ultralight. And here's Tom having some fun on an afternoon, zooming over some of these hills made out of the kitchen fly, made out of the loos. And you can see it just stretches as far as the eye can see. It's a very unique landscape. You don't have to tell most of you. You know what the country's like over there. But it is really unique. Really, really unique. I can't think of other places in North America that have this kind of a set of rolling hills. And Tom has fun with that. So, the salt lava rock, 15 million. Lust that's been deposited in the last 2.6 million years. Now, let's get into the stuff we're talking about tonight, which are the uh, Ice Age floods. Yes, break through the Purcell lobe. Yes, get that water in distinct channels coming across eastern Washington. And that water is going to make it all the way to the mouth of the Columbia, 
The water is also going to be slack as it goes down to Eugene, Oregon. It's truly a Pacific Northwest story. Four states are involved. The water many times is coming from Glacial Lake, Missoula. We know exactly the high water mark of that lake in the valleys of western Montana, both behind the campus of University of Montana, we can see these old beaches or these old strand lines. The floors of many of these valleys in western Montana have glacial lake Missoula deposits within them. If we drain the lake quickly, we're in glacial lake Missoula now, we're in Montana, we can get these gravels that are formed into these beautiful giant current ripples as the water is leaving in a hurry. The water leaves, it goes across the panhandle of Idaho, it all rejoins at Wamula Gap. That's our narrow bottleneck to get this water out of here. And Lake Lewis is forming as a result. The Purcell Trench Lobe specifically looks like this. If you know Sand Point, that was into the Purcell Trench Lobe. If you know Lake Ponderé, that's ground zero for this ice dam failing and reforming, failing and reforming. And notice that we've changed the frigid blue water into chocolate milk because we start picking up the soil, the sediment, as we flow over eastern Washington. Put it in motion from Oregon Public Broadcasting, a nice animation from quite a while ago showing the channeled scab lands. This is the angry water. This is the fast, loud water. But here's our quiet water. Here's our quiet water in the Yakima Valley. Here's some quiet water. Once it gets through, we're in the gap. It's the quiet spots that are going to help us tonight get some ages. But we're still just trying to wrap our minds around the drama of the release of the water. Another animation showing the Purcell Trench Lobe at Lake Ponderé. Let's bust it up. Let's release the water from Glacial Lake Missoula. We don't know exactly what it looked like this, but this is a, makes sense to me. And we're stirring up the soil to make chocolate milk. We're taking broken pieces of the ice dam and converting them into icebergs that are now going to float. Now this animator, I don't know who he is, he went a little bit crazy. We got all of Washington being swallowed up by a flood. <laughs> we need to scale that back, though. This is too much. This is too much. This is effective if we happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and again, this is, this. I guess we don't want to change the channel here, right? So we're going to just have everybody get swallowed up <laughs> with this wall. What did that experience feel like? Was the ground shaking? Could you hear the audible roar for minutes or more? Uh, difficult to know. The yellow star is Dry Falls. The red star is Ellensburg. We missed the whole show. Not one drop of Ice Age flood water got into the Kittitas Valley, but Vantage got hammered. So there, again, there's no doubt of where the water's hit and where the water's missed, and that's very clear if you go out and take a look. Now let's leave I-90 and go up on 17 and visit Dry Falls. I said we weren't going there tonight, but I think I do want to go there just to, to capture the volume of the water and the source of much of the water that is going to fill our temporary bathtub called Lake Lewis. So you can raise your hand. I'm sure almost everybody's been to Dry Falls. It's a very popular place on the way up to Grand Coulee Dam. It's a place to stop. There's a bathroom. There's ice cream. There's everything that you'd ever want right there at the visitor center. And this has been a place to stop for almost 100 years now. Dry Falls State Park, Sun Lake State Park. And so we're back with Model T Fords and everything and families stopping and contemplating the Ice Age floods. That old Vista house, not the Vista House in the Columbia River Gorge, this is a different Vista House that's at Dry Falls, has been there for almost 100 years. And the experience is similar to it has been for decades. You stand in your little cage, you look down, we've got Dry Falls, and we contemplate the water, the water that poured over that cliff. Oh, this is America. We don't even have to get out of the car to contemplate. We can just <laughs> sit right there. Our buddy Tom, again, is going to fly now over Dry Falls. He's approaching the lip of Dry Falls from the south. So the visitor center is over here, the parking lot's over here. And I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, look at all the rock that left. The water took all this rock away. But notice the size of these holes that have been drilled into the top of this bench above Dry Falls. That's water that did that. These are enormous potholes drilled by Ice Age flood water. 
The coulee itself, the Grand Coulee, is the hallmark feature of Ice Age flood erosion. And so remember, we used to have a continuous blanket of loess, and all that basalt lava rock was there before the Ice Age. Now in places, we're missing whole chunks of it because the Ice Age floods came through and took everything away. Carl Lilquist, teaching a field trip. Many of you have gone on many of our Sunday afternoon field trips at Dry Falls. The story of Dry Falls. It's comforting to read that. Now, here's my problem. For almost 100 years, people have been in that parking lot at Dry Falls and have been visualizing this. Oh, look, honey, kids, gather around. Let's look at this. This used to be a waterfall. And everybody looking at that cliff pictures Niagara Falls. And I understand why. It's a very famous waterfall. Niagara Falls is a river, a thin skiff of water falling over a cliff, making a horseshoe shape. That's not what we want for the Ice Age floods. This is not the best view, visual for Dry Falls unless it's a very small flood of the one of the many floods coming down the Grand Coulee when the Okanagan Lobe is in place. So to remedy that, we visited some animators in Portland. This is in a trendy northwest neighborhood of Portland. Everybody's got the right clothes and the right eyewear. And they're very, very nice folks. And they're extremely skilled. And I just grabbed my iPhone and started snapping some photos. I'm not even sure I asked um, this young man if I could take his photo. But they, I don't know how they did it, but they created what we were looking for for a little TV program we were doing on Dry Falls. So here are some of the raw clips that they were able to put together. Chris Smart from Central Washington University took a drone and lifted it. So that's real photography. But then the guys down there in Portland put some water in it. So we're lifting the drone over the parking lot. What's that guy's name? It's not Chris. Chris, what was that guy's name? Donald. Donald, but his worker at the, at the workstation. Can't do it. Donald's assistant uh, was really the guy behind this, but Donald also, Donald Newman put this together. So let's do a couple more. They did a beautiful job. This is more photography from Chris Smart, and then Again, don't ask me how they do this, but uh, they were proud of how much RAM they used and the processor and all this stuff. And, and uh, the net result is, and I've heard from people that have seen this program and have emailed me and said, I think you've sensationalized here. I think you went a little bit too overboard. This is, this is too much. I don't, think, I don't think you're right. If anything, we were conservative. The field evidence says this is a 350 foot high cliff and there was 350 feet of water coming over the cliff. So, if anything, we chose a smaller flood, if you want to think of it that way. Chocolate brown. Good reactions, thank you. Here's a nice little touch by Chris Smart. There you go. <laughs> so here's the finished product. There was more than 350 feet of water moving 65 miles an hour over this cliff. This is water from a bursting ice dam 170 miles away in Idaho that ripped through central Washington. A wall of water that dwarfed the local landscape with the energy of 10 times the power of all the world's rivers combined. An ice age flood with water, rock, soil, and icebergs three and a half miles wide on a thundering journey to the Pacific Ocean. Thank you, Chris Smart, for all that work. Okay, looking north, Dry Falls is here. The upper Grand Coulee is in the distance, all the way up to Grand Coulee Dam. Look at how much damage. We're still with the energetic water. We haven't even gotten to the quiet water yet. But it's too fun to wrap our minds around how much energy it took to rip up the basalt this way and to drill the potholes. This is a truck. These are 50, 50 feet deep, and 
quite a good size in diameter. Ancient lakes, otherwise known as Potholes Coulee, near Quincy. Frenchman Coulee, many of us know. These are all places that are a direct result of super energetic water cutting into the bedrock. Mm -hmm. The Palouse River Falls, the Palouse Canyon, the Palouse Falls over by Poland. They all were formed quickly by many of these Ice Age floods, but you want to know exactly which flood did what, and we're not there yet. We maybe never will be there with the evidence that we've been able to put together. Let's go to where some of this water from Spokane heads down over Palouse Falls and dump into the Snake River. This is the Snake River, and on the inside of both of these curves, giant flood bars are right on the edge of the river. How do you pile gravel 200 feet above the river? Did the Snake River pile this gravel up that high, or is something else going on here? Okay, well, let's think about this. In river channels, where is the slow water? On the sides of a channel, on the inside of curves, and when rivers slow down as they enter a broad valley. Flood bars form in those quiet spots. You've walked along a river. You know what the rocks look like in flood bars. The bigger the flood, the bigger the rocks. Giant flood bars mean giant floods, the Ice Age floods. Those giant flood bars next to the Snake River, Snake River didn't make those. The Ice Age floods created those. The giant flood oh, we got it. So the water is eventually going through Wallula Gap. It's going through the Columbia River Gorge. We have erosive chasms carved by Ice Age flood water in the Columbia River Gorge as well. Let me show you a couple of photos of that. Here's the water surging down to Eugene. So Lilo Falls a direct result of the energetic water coming down the Columbia River Gorge. The next time you drive to Portland down the Columbia River Gorge, notice that the bottom two-thirds of those gorge walls are scoured, exposed basalt bedrock by the Ice Age floods. But the upper third of the walls of the Columbia River Gorge have their lifts, they have their silt. They're doing the farming up high, and the ranch is down below the high water mark. If you know where to look, this, these pieces of evidence are everywhere. The Vista House in the Columbia River Gorge, some of the big floods got almost up to the parking lot here at the Vista House. Hmm. I thought of doing this this afternoon. I looked on Google Maps. What, how long would it take me to drive from Sand Point, where the ice dam was for the Glacier Lake Missoula floods, and drive to Astoria, Oregon? And according to Google Maps, it would take me about eight and a half hours without stopping, I guess. So who would win? <laughs> me or the floods? If the floods give me a head start, am I going to make it to the ocean before then? Okay, we are finally to slackwater sediment time. Don't give up on me now. We got, we got more, but we're finally to what we want to settle our eyes on. This is Burlingame Ravine. This is the place with the 40 slackwater sediments. Now that you know the significance of these beds, let me remind you, it's the soil upstream. It's the soil that looks like this. It's the soil that looks like this. It's rolling wheat fields, winter wheat. And the hills are made out of loess, silt, kitchen flour, wind-blown silt. Before the Ice Age, this is what Eastern Washington looked like. All right, thank you. So the loess is sitting right on top of the basalt. And by the way, the chemistry of the loess has nothing to do with the rock chemistry. So usually soils are the result of broken down bedrock, but in this case, we blow this stuff in from the north from crushed granite and metamorphic rocks. Okay, another quarry nearby Ritzville, light colored loess sitting on top of the soil. I'm setting you up to remind you of the slack water sediments. Now look, do you see something different here? Our rolling hills suddenly stop. Why? The floods came through and they took a bunch of the soil away. Here's Tom again, flying. To his right, the Los Hills are intact. The floods never hit that area. But look at how obvious it is to his left. All the soil is gone, and where did it go? It got carried downstream until we get to Lake Lewis, and then we start dropping that soil. Remember? So we're going to find the missing soil, I don't know, 50, 70 miles down, down the road, 
in a, the form of a slack water sediment layer. So when you drive from Ritzville to Spokane, you're either in the Lewis Hills or you're not. Lewis Hills or you're not. Lewis Hills didn't get carried away. Everything else did. You starting to see it now? It's really beautiful and very simple, very elegant. There's these islands of Lewis that were untouched, but everything surrounding those islands, the soil got swept away by the floods. How about that? A recent National Geographic article. Up high, looking down on one of the remaining islands of Lus in the Chini Palouse scab lab. Finally, we're going to get that stuff, the sediment that was taken away, to deposit. You ready? Slack water sediment. So let's go to Waluba first. 40 layers, 40 separate lakes, 40 separate floods. You remember the chalkboard discussion now. 11 from the top. Mount St. Helens Ash, can't see it in this photo. So I, over the weekend, I kind of put this together with all my little Sharpie marking pens and tried to correlate them by time, 13,000 down to 19,000 years ago. And we're at Bowling Game Ravine right now. Here's some wonderful video on loan to us from the Washington Wine Commission. This is private land, and they got permission to fly their drone in Bowling Game Ravine. Um, and that's no longer possible. Um, and so we're lucky to have this, this footage from the wine people. Thank you for that. They put a little promo video together for their industry. But for our purposes, they're dropping us right down to these flock water sediment layers. You might be interested that this canal was not here. This ditch was not here before 1926. There was a, an accident with an irrigation ditch and the water left the canal and started digging aggressively into this soft material. So a week worth of accidental water in the 20s carved this canyon, not the Ice Age floods. But remember, there's a person for scale they're flying the drone. The bigger, the thicker layers are at the bottom, the thinner are up high. That was the signature that we had on the chalkboard at all three of our locations. Where are we? Bottom of Lake Lewis, near Walla Walla. Burlingame Ravine, 40 layers. Let's leave Burlingame. Do we have other beds? You drive I-82, you go by Zilla every time. Zilla, the town of Zilla, excuse me, the town of Zilla is on top of some of these beds. The Mount St. Helens ash is not 11 from the top. I think it's four from the top. We go to Yakima Valley. We can get a good look. This is near Benton City. And we can see that the Mount St. Helens and Ash, 16,300 years ago, actually is found in a couplet. A couplet. There's two distinct eruptions of that St. Helens Ash, separated by maybe a few years. I'm not quite sure. I don't know if anybody knows. So that's the St. Helens Ash close up, a good time marker for us in this black water sediment. Let's go to the Pasco Basin. This is the White Bluffs along the free flowing stretch of the Columbia, known as the Hanford Reach. More slack water sediments, a person up there for scale. Each of these is a flood separated by some other deposits. You see how beautiful this is and how um, plentiful these slack water sediments are? Here's a person for scale walking on bad knees. And you can see separate slack water sediments at the white bluffs. No ashes in this location at all. We don't know where we are. We have no idea about the ages. One more with Lake Lewis. Let's go, of all places, to Lewiston, Idaho, where in Hell's Canyon, for goodness sake. So the water waiting to go through Wallula Gap with a big flood, there was so much water that the lake crept its way up the snake all the way into a portion of Hell's Canyon. That quiet chocolate milk, quiet water got all the way to Lewiston. So this is a key spot. These are slack water sediments from the Missoula floods. We're in Tammany Bar just south of Lewiston, Idaho. Each of these is a separate Missoula flood. We're 150 miles upstream from Wallula Gap. That means water from Montana made it to Wallula Gap and had to back up this far up the Snake River drainage. This is one event, silt falling from the bottom of Lake Lewis and another flood, and another flood. Now that's amazing. 20 slack water sediments 
Missoula floods, on top of this, remember, this one flood from Utah that came through southern Idaho called the Bonneville flood. We know the age of the Bonneville flood, so this is another way to keep track of time. Uh, the date when we made this video program for the Bonneville was 17,400. There's a new paper out that says we're closer to 18,000 years ago for the Bonneville. Not sure where they're getting that number, but um, regardless, it's an old event, and it's water release, releasing out of Lake Bonneville, through the Snake River, through Hell's Canyon, one flood, let's go ahead with that one date, 17,400 years ago. And it helps us keep track of time. So this is in the Snake River in southern Idaho, where floods, one flood, sorry, one flood, the Bonneville flood, look at all these grounds, boulders, polished by water. One flood. How can you walk through that field and not think something unusual didn't happen? <laughs> right. Gorgeous deposit. All these rocks were deposited by the Bonneville flood. Just one flood, right? Just a few weeks. All these rocks were dropped 17,400 years ago. Sitting on top are Missoula flood sediments. There are 20 different Missoula flood layers here. So at this spot, we had 20 Missoula floods after the Bonneville flood. South of Lewiston, Idaho. Great location. Let's leave Lake Lewis finally. We'll, we're in the waning stages of this talk. Let's go up to Glacial Lake Columbia briefly. And those are the 89 beds. This is behind Okanagan Lobe. Brian Atwater doing the work back in the 1980s. We're here in the sand coil arm of Lake Roosevelt. Black and white photos, but hopefully we'll still give the impression that we've got this repetitive... Uh, I failed to mention that slackwater sediments are also sometimes called rhythmites. And there's something else called a varve. So these should look different to you. This is one slackwater sediment layer. That's one slackwater sediment at the top. But these dark white, dark white bands are annual deposits called varves. We've got a clip to help explain that in just a second. Michelle Hansen, also in Glacial Lake Columbia, finds that carbon date of 13,400. Here's her paper in 2016 from Glacial Lake Columbia. More familiar, these all look familiar to us now. And that's the point. These familiar beds you can find where the water was quiet. Glacial Lake Columbia stretches all the way to downtown Spokane, right outside of Spokane. There are some beds in Lataw Creek. Also, a place to worth count the slackwater sediments. These out by the Spokane Airport are mysterious. I don't know what to do with these. This is a coarse sand and some ripped up blocks that are clearly from the Ice Age floods, but uh, there's ongoing discussions about what that thick set of coarse sand is telling us. It's quite a spot. It's in a quarry near the Spokane Airport, but I don't know what to do with this quite yet. Finally, we go up to Montana, to the source of many of the floods, the place right along I-90. The lake was known first by Joseph Pardee back in 1910, even before Bretz was starting to work on this problem. And this is the famous nine miles exposure right along the freeway. Maybe I'll show you a little video clip and see if you remember. Remember, this is the one that has the Glacier Peak ash on top, and all these slackwater sediments are down below. These are famous silty beds west of Missoula, partly because we're still debating the significance of them. These are rhythmites. There's 40 of them here. With that zebra striping, what's the story? Why are these delicate silts still here? if this is a place where high-energy flood water was cruising through. These repetitive layers of silt and mud contain details with important clues. But debate continues on what these layers are telling us about Glacial Lake Missoula's history. Even the terms are confusing. Rhythmites, varves, are they the same thing? Not here at Nine Mile. Interstate 90, from the freeway you can see the rhythmites 
dark, light, dark, light from the freeway. Those are the zebra stripes. But within one dark zebra stripe, varves at a tinier scale. Dark, light, dark, light. Those are annual patterns. Dark, light, couplet. That's one winter, summer pattern. Varves, rhythmites. Many geologists see the more than 500 varve couplets here as annual layers, like counting tree rings in the mud. But not everybody agrees that these tiny layers are annual. So there is a tradition then of banging those two closed bathtubs and counting the varves to keep track of time. And if you have 50 varve couplets, you've got 50 years of refilling Glacial Lake Missoula before it busts out again. If you've got a hundred varves between two slack water sediments, you've got a, a full century between floods. But even that kind of counting has its opponents, and so it's not conventional knowledge. Here's some OSL dates from Larry Smith, who's been working in Glacial Lake Missoula. Also don't know quite to do yet with those dates. They're promising, but they don't fit into the nice narrative that I gave you on the chalkboard. Finally, the erratics. The erratics. The blocks of rock that clearly removed tens of miles by the floodwaters themselves. They don't match. Everything is basically basalt lava rock. And so if you see any big boulder that's not basalt, you know that it came in by the Ice Age floods, if you're south of the ice sheet itself. They stand out like a sore thumb, or that's a, that's a negative term. They're beautiful. And uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of these, and I'm sure that you know uh, where some are located. You can look at the granite and find bedrock matches. There's granite at the surface in the bedrock right at Grand Coulee Dam. So that's a possible place for some of the granite erratics. And the locomotion for many of those boulders is to raft on on these blocks of ice. Remember the icebergs are the broken up pieces of the ice dam up in northern Idaho. This is a really beautiful uh, erratic, south of Sentinel Gap, so we're near the town of Mattel. And John Stone from the University of Washington, using the surface exposure thing I was talking about with the radioactive isotopes, his date for how long that boulder's been sitting there is 14,050 years. Ice rafted erratics near Mattel, Washington. Oh, we don't need you. All right, so we've got students coming out there, checking out. They love that boulder. You can hike out to it pretty easily. It's about a 20-minute walk from the car. Lake Lewis, we use the mapped locations of those erratics and the rhythmites to put this together, and we can visualize these icebergs floating in on top of Tri-Cities as Lake Lewis is formed. We play the same game up in Wenatchee and up the Wenatchee River. Every gold star here is an ice rafted erratic that came in. The fast moving water was coming down to Columbia and the quiet water was creeping up. This is the 18,000 year old floods when the Okanagan lobe was not in place yet. Flood water lapping up against that glacier? That's quite a story. What evidence do we have for that? We've used Ice Age flood erratics and rhythmites to reconstruct this part of the story. Erratics. Light-colored boulders scattered on the hillsides here in the Wenatchee River Valley. Up to 300 feet above the river are those boulders. Up to 600 feet above the river here at Wenatchee, we've got these ice-rafted erratics. Telling us where the high water mark was of this quiet bathtub water working its way up the Wenatchee River. In fact, all the beautiful orchards that are in the floor of the Wenatchee Valley are on a slack water sediment, to be precise. So here's a boulder that Andrea Balbus dated using the surface exposure. 18,200 years ago, that boulder's been sitting there on Sunny Slope, just to the north side of Wenatchee. Andrea, let's meet her. She's at Dry Falls talking to some folks. There's a new technique to work with the surfaces of these boulders to figure out exactly how many years they've been sitting here. In other words, there's a new way to determine the age of the Ice Age floods. So the cosmogenic nuclei dating technique is very valuable because it brings something new to this story. It lets us date the landform specifically. So we can go to the Wallula Gap and we can date a giant boulder there 
and tell you when it was put down and massive water was coming through and backed up behind the Wallula Gap. We can date giant rafted boulders in western Wenatchee and tell you when a massive flood came through that area. We can talk about the Afraid of Fan and talk about when the debris dam failed. We can talk about these events that crafted these geomorphic features through time very specifically for the first time in the study of the Pleistocene megafloods. Thank you, Andrea. She's a promising newcomer on this story. And here's some images from her paper that came out a couple of years ago. Every red uh, figure there is a separate ice rafted erratic. This is an important plot. 10,000 to 20,000 years ago, she's got a bunch of ice rafted erratics that were sitting there for about 14,000 years. Another collection, 15,500. And here are the Wenatchee erratics at 18,000 plus. The green line is what I'd like to mention briefly. There's a spike in the green line at about 18,000 years ago. There's new work that's been done. The floor of the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Washington. And the work has been done looking at diatoms in the sediment on the ocean floor. Freshwater diatoms. So this spike is telling the researchers that are working with the Pacific Ocean sediments that a huge freshwater dump went into the Pacific at about 18,000 years ago. Why? An ice age flood or two. The Bonneville flood about that time and some of our monster floods coming over Wenatchee, when Wenatchee was wet, is also about that time. So that's a new frontier, working with sediments in the Pacific to help understand the timing of these Ice Age floods. So busy maps like this are from Andrea and Richard Waite's talks. I gave you the, sh the chalkboard version that's down and dirty. I'm happy to share this paper by Richard Waite with you to put through these timing panels. There's other things going on, of course. So I don't expect us to really absorb much of this except to see that that basic story that's emerging from both Andrea and Richard's work is coming out. Here's a quick glimpse and listen to Richard Wade. The other, the other big thing in that area was the mouth of Moses Cooley. There was a big bar. There is a big bar, and it has quite a few beds in it. Um, they had come out of Moses Cooley. Uh, because they're basaltic. Um, the, the Columbia Valley for, uh, from the north has got all of these crystalline rocks in it and sedimentary rocks, uh, mm -hmm. bright colored gravel. Mm -hmm. Anything coming from the east across the Columbia Plain, Columbia Plateau, is basaltic. Yeah. And so stuff coming out of, the gravel coming out of Moses Cooley was basaltic. So you could easily recognize where it came from. It, it, it had come into the Columbia from Moses Cooley and not down the Columbia past Wenatchee. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moses Cooley was dammed off during most of the flood history because of the Okanagan lobe had covered the upper end of the Cooley, so water couldn't get into it. And yet it obviously is a flood cut, huge Cooley. Sure. It's second in grandeur only to Grand, Grand Cooley. It really is. Um, at the mouth of Moses Cooley, I could find five gravel beds separated by finer, uh, finer sediments. And um, some of them were so fine, it was clear that the water had actually stopped in between. So here is evidence that it, at the mouth of Moses Cooley, there had been not just one flood, but two or even five, down a coulee that had been blocked off during most of the history of the flood. So, so this was another eye-opener. And pre previous to working with those deposits, you were a one-flood person? Well, you, yes. You, mm -hmm. you, you, um, there's a principle called Occam's Razor, where you shave your interpretation down so that it's no more elaborate than the evidence allows. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, I didn't have any evidence for more than one big flood. Mm -hmm. that, big, that huge bar in Wenatchee that I'd recognized and some, a few other features. I knew those. There's a guy that went on to do the work with Bowen Bean Ken down by Walla Walla. The other big, Moses Cooley is a problem. It's still uh, difficult to explain. We had a visitor from Canada, from Vancouver Island University, who has a novel idea that might have some promise. My argument is that what we're looking at from Omaha Plateau crossing the Columbia to Waterville Plateau the Foster Creek, the Mansfield Channels, the Moses Cooley, is one single integrated drainage system. It's a single integrated drainage system. It may operate in segments. It may operate at different times or be reutilized at different times. We're getting into some details we'll, we can chat about a bit later. So Jerome is making the case that there's some subglacial flows, that you can have major ice age floods come up from underneath the Okanagan Road and pour right down Moses Cooley. 
So to be continued with that as well. The panels, the panels, the story in my simple terms and both Richard's and Andrea's dates are in the upper left. And there's a disagreement on some of the specifics, but the business of bringing the Purcell lobe down, then bringing the Okanagan lobe, then getting rid of the Purcell lobe, then finally getting the Okanagan lobe is what we want as the general chronology that may be new information for many of you. There's loads and loads of evidence to back up that basic chronology. We're going to finish by going to a famous place called West Bar with enormous giant current ripples and a small boat, probably a big boat, on the Columbia River. And we now, with this dating business and Richard's work, have been able to realize that the last major flood down the Columbia, after we bust up the Okanagan Lobe, is responsible for the giant current ripples across the river from Trinidad and Crescent Bar. This is Crescent Bar here. And this patch of real estate is that last gas, that coda, that small flood coming directly from Canada. I hate to bring this up, but I'm going to. There are places out in eastern Washington that are flood gravels that are severely weathered. They look really old. And they're in huge piles here out by Ritzville, here by the Gorge Amphitheater. They both lie beneath a sediment horizon that clearly is older than 780,000 years ago. Let me repeat. There are some flood gravels in just a few spots in eastern Washington that are for sure brought in and deposited by flood water older than 780,000 years ago. So I know this is a departure from what we were just talking about, but it's worth mentioning that we have many, many very, very old Ice Age floods with very scant evidence for that. But there's a few places that tell us the chronology I'm sharing with you tonight is just the last floods of a two and a half million year storm. I promised I'd finish with some archaeology slides. We've got dates from Paisley Caves in Oregon that go back to 14,600 years ago now. We had Dennis Jenkins from the University of Oregon visiting our campus a couple months ago. He's got human hair, it's 12,500 years ago in this Oregon cave. He's got artifacts and copper lights, do I know what that is? We've got dates for those going back 13,000, 14,000. What's the latest date of our Ice Age floods in the Pacific Northwest? The last big one was 14,000. The last flood was smaller, 13,300. We're already overlapped. Now we're in Oregon with the Paisley Caves. There are some tools below Glacier Peak Ash uh, near Potholes Coulee, and the Painborn Bar location, which is East Wenatchee, has artifacts right at 13,000. They'd be close. So again, this is not my specialty, but let's use this book that I found to visit a couple of quick places visually. There was an archaeological dig right by Painborn Airport, East Wenatchee, 1987. And they were finding these tools in East Wenatchee on top of a giant flood bar that Richard White was talking about. Archaeologically, these tools date to 13,000. So, 13,000? That's too young for our Ice Age floods, right? By a few centuries. Uh, the Mars Rock Shelter, Palouse River as it enters into the Snake. Major archaeological digs there, especially as they're putting the dams in and flooding those valleys from back in the 1960s. This is a basalt spear point or knife, and Jim Chavish was in there in the 1960s, early in his career, and they were finding human remains on the floodplain below the Mons Rock Shelter, dating to 11,200 years ago. These are calendar years now, not really a problem, and uh, parts of uh, humans. Also in the rock shelter itself, human remains going back more than 10,000 years. Please remember now, these are too young to be tied to the ISH floods, but I'm just giving you a little quick survey of all the, of the known archaeological sites that have yielded some data. Just south of Vantage, Sentinel Gap, back in 1997, they were finding hundreds of thousands of stone tools, stone artifacts, all dating to about 12,000 calendar years. 
over by Lind Pool on the way to Ritzville, essentially. A big set of archaeological digs in the 1970s. And some butchered bison bones from 12,500 years ago. I'm sharing these dates and reminding you again, we're a little too young for the Ice Age folks directly, but people, especially at the Painfully Caves, are definitely in the Pacific Northwest for the last couple of major floods and minor floods of the Pacific Northwest. Some recommendations and we're done. This book is outstanding. My Introduction to Archaeological in Washington, written by Ruth Kirk and Richard Dorn. It's ordered online. It showed up a couple days later. Beautifully done. Books on the Ice Age Floods for general readers. You can't get better than this. On the Trail of the Ice Age Floods by Bruce Bjornstead, books one and two. And for free, you can go on right now or on your way home tonight, hugefloods.com, a beautiful collection of photographs and videos by a fellow by the name of Tom Foster, who lives in Pasco, and uh, he has done an amazing job with his website, spreading the gospel of the Ice Age Floods with photographs like this. Many of the good photos in this presentation were directly from Tom Foster, so thanks for him. And thanks to you, everybody, for coming and contemplating the ages of these wonderful Ice Age Floods. Thanks for coming tonight, everybody.